pleasure to be introducing tonight's guest, or tonight's speaker, guest speaker, uh, Professor Jacob Dalton, um, who is uh, the Kansas State Foundation University Professor of Tibetan Buddhism at the University of California, Berkeley. So uh, Professor Dalton's research focuses on tantric ritual, Nyingma religious history, and the Dunhuang manuscripts. Uh, prior to joining UC Berkeley, he taught at Yale University and held a postdoc research position with the International Dunhuang Project. Uh, he's the author of several books, many of which you probably know, including The Taming of the Demons, Violence and Liberation in Tibetan Buddhism, published in uh, 2011, and most recently, uh, Conjuring the Buddha, Ritual Manuals in Early Tantric Buddhism, which is uh, the book from which uh, tonight's talk is drawn from. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Dalton. Thank you, James. And uh, uh, I'm glad to be here <laughs> among a lot of familiar faces and grateful to the Stanford's uh, Ho Center for Buddhist Studies for inviting me. Um, so, as this, uh, as my title suggests, this talk is on uh, the early history of Buddhist sexual yoga, um, and this may not be a topic much discussed, but I insist that the relevant practices, whether performed for real in the flesh or in the imagination, have been an important aspect of Buddhism in India and Tibet from at least the 11th or 8th century to today. Um, so this is clear, first of all, right off the bat from the canonical tantras uh, preserved in both Sanskrit and Tibetan. Um, but we can get a more nuanced or more, many more nuanced glimpses of the, of the development of these practices by looking at the local literatures outside the canon. And this is what uh, my book is really about. Um, so my book considers in particular the Tibetan manuscripts from Dunhuang and, uh, and um, especially the ritual manuals among those manuscripts. When I was asked to come to the British Library to catalog the tantric manuscripts um, in the Stein collection there, I naively assumed I'd be reading a lot of tantras and it turned out uh, that there's really only one or two and hundreds of ritual manuals, um, which in a way isn't surprising, of course. This is what people actually use to do their daily practices. So this kind of shifted my perspective on tantric literature and this book, 20 years later, is kind of uh, the result of my musings about these questions of uh, local ritual writings and their place in the tradition. Uh, so, basically, the book argues that the Dunhuang manuscripts are important not just for their earliness, but for the genres they preserve, uh, meaning these kind of daily writings of practicing Buddhists. Um, and in that sense, these ritual writings give you uh, insights into the developments of ritual sort of in process, like between the tantras. And then occasionally a tantra is written to sort of re-encapsulate the latest developments, but um, these are the, the kind of petri dish where innovation and new rituals uh, are free to develop. And, um, and so the, the book basically proceeds, each chapter after the first couple of chapters, each one takes a particular manuscript as, and, and sort of delves into it. Uh, and uh, so the very first chapter uh, basically makes the argument, explores the, tra traces the rise of this whole genre of ritual manuals, which I argue uh, really exploded on the scene in India starting in the second half of the fifth century and uh, grew through the sixth century around Dharani Sutras, Mahayana Dharani Sutras. You start seeing all these vidis, which circulated alongside the, the, the sutras or and eventually started to be worked into them, appended to them, and so on. Um, and it's not long after that you start seeing, by the seventh century, sort of standalone tantras, which some of, many of the earliest tantras are basically compilations of these ritual manuals, framed as Buddhavachana. 
and, uh, and given a, a sutra or later tantra title. Uh, so after that, that initial chapter, I then go into studies of each of these different vidis or kalpas or sadhanas. And, um, and uh, this talk basically comes out of the book's final chapter, which I spent some time yesterday rereading and regretting terribly that I published it <laughs> because <laughs> I've just had time to think it through and it's kind of just a meandering mess in the book. Th it was the last chapter and it was the hardest manuscript to really th figure out. Um, so you're getting a slightly better digested take on it today. Um, but basically it's the same as the chapter. Um, and it's, it's particularly exploring the very beginnings of what's called the subtle body um, in Tantric Buddhism. So just to give you a sense, in case you don't already know what I'm talking about, um, most classically you have the central channel running down the, the middle of the torso and then two side channels crossing at various chakras along the way. Um, and these are then manipulated using breathing practices and um, in sexual yoga. And in fact, I mean, uh, you all know this perfectly well, but still, were there a larger popular audience here, I would note that this is at the beginnings of what we today know as uh, yoga in the, <laughs> in the uh, you know, hot yoga studios scattered across California and so on. Um, anyway, so, uh, so in a way what this, what this book is really looking at is what do these Tibetan Dunhuang manuscripts tell us about the development of tantric ritual in India. So I'm, even though they're all written in Tibetan, I'm using them as a kind of window into India. Um, and uh, and uh, that, so, okay, so that sort of sets the stage. I wanna, it's a little bit of a technical talk, so that's why I have the handout as well as the slides. Um, and to just give you a, a preview of what to expect, I'll first be giving you kind of an introduction, setting the kind of terminological stage, which might be helpful for people who don't work on Tantric Buddhism. And then, uh, and then I'm going to just introduce my primary text, which is this manuscript Paleo Tibetan 634, and uh, describe this one practice that you see there. And then look at some other uh, Dunhuang evidence that's relevant to that practice. And finally, having kind of gotten an idea, an idea of what this practice is, I want to delve into where these, this, this new, these new practices of working with the breath in the context of sexual yoga are coming from. And looking back into earlier uh, tantric Buddhist writings. So first, setting the terminological stage. Um, in order to really contextualize this, you have to know that tantric writings were sort of organically emerging through the 7th and 8th century, and finally around the mid-8th, they start to be put into classes, classified. And the first classification system we know of talks about Kriya Tantras and Yoga Tantras, and these are distinguished according to whether the ritual practices are directed outwardly toward an image, um, a, a statue or, or maybe a stupa or something, or inwardly into your heart or into yourself as the Buddha. So there are Kriya Tantras and Yoga Tantras, and you have this on your handout. Well, I didn't put the Kriya because ultimately that's not that relevant for this talk. But, um, and then uh, what happens in the second half of the in mid middle and the second half of the 8th century is you get what I call early Maha Yoga. Um, which is where you first start to really see sexual yogas being talked about. You see little references in some of the yoga tantras to secret practices and secret in, the, in those, for, for example, the Sarva Tathagata Tattva Sangraha is basically means sexual, but nobody's really talking about what they are. And it's only with these Maha Yoga tantras that you really get them spelled out with increasing clarity. But what's interesting is that they talk about sexual yoga, these Maha Yoga materials, without any subtle body uh, technologies, There's not, which, which today is almost unthinkable. The whole point of sexual yoga is to manipulate the energies in your body. So that was an interesting insight. 
and those are the materials, the, the, the manuscript that we're going to be focusing on tonight is, is from this class of Mahayoga Tantric material. I want to just add this other class of Tantras, the Ubaya Tantras. Um, in that mid 8th century uh, text that first talks about the Kriya and the Yoga Tantras, um, it's by Buddha Gupta, this great scholar from India, and he does mention this other this other category of ubaya, meaning both outward and inward tantras. And I'll be getting back to that uh, because that is relevant to what we're going to be talking about. And there's some question in my mind at least about whether he really intended this to be an independent, a third class alongside kriya and yoga, or whether it was just that there are some tantras that partake of both kriya and yoga and it's not really its own separate class. But we'll be getting back to that. So uh, on the handout, I, I provided some titles of some tantras belonging to Ubaya Yoga and early Maha Yoga that are particularly relevant for our talk, but also considered the kind of main tantras for those classes. Um, the Mahavirochana Bhisambodhi, Sarvas Tadagata Tattvasangraha, and the Griya Samaja Tantra. Here they are. So. Uh, after I introduce our manuscript, I'll be returning to related materials and I'll be touching on these in more depth. So, what I'm calling early Maha Yoga was really the kind of cutting edge of tantric practice in, at the time, in Dunhuang in the 10th century, which is when our manuscript dates from. Um, and interestingly, it was the cutting edge of tantric practice in India, not in the 10th century, but in the late 8th century. So there's almost 200 year lag there, um, which I could, I've talked about elsewhere, but basically there's a lag between when, it come, when it's circulating in India, makes its way to Tibet, is translated into Tibetan, and eventually makes its way to Dunhuang. So in terms of using these Tibetan manuscripts as a window into India, you have to keep in mind, I'm talking about 10th century manuscripts that reflect really uh, the late 8th century. And I can talk about that more in the Q&A if you're interested. But, um, and uh, so in these texts, when you look into sort of the daily sadhana practice of Mahayoga pra uh, uh, ritual, um, you find these two stages. They're, there's only a couple of references to them but they are already there. The generation stage and perfection stage, or Upadikrama and Upanakrama, Kyirim or Dzokrim in Tibetan. Um, and those are known today. Uh, and just for the uninitiated, the, it generally means, uh, generation stage generally means where you develop yourself imaginatively into a Buddha, identifying with the Buddha. And then the perfection stage is where you then perform various acts from within that state of realization. Namely, in our, for our purposes, sexual yoga. And the tantric practice of Dunhuang, in, in, in terms of Maha Yoga practice, is mostly based on, again, this Guya Samaja Tantra um, that is listed here uh, under Maha Yoga. So, I say and the, uh, that, that this is sexual yoga with Utpati Krama and Utpana Krama stages all in place without sexual yoga. And that is generally true for the manuscript of Dunhuang, except that uh, I was always bothered by this one manuscript, which is our focus, Paleo Tibetan 634. Um, and actually, there's a pairing to it, which is Paleo Tibetan 626. Um, the different, they're both commentaries on the same root sadhana, written in red here, so with interlinear commentary. And in our manuscript, the commentary is this small writing in between the lines. But they're talking about the same text, and in fact, the handwriting is the same. So it's the same person writing uh, two slightly different, generally the same, but slightly different commentaries on the same root text, root sadhana, root, the, the ritual text that, it's, that it is the focus. So that tells us, first of all, that the commentarial notes, with, without which you really can't make head or tail of this text, were probably written in Dunhuang. Where the root 
text itself was written as, a, as an open question. It could have been written at Dunhuang. I suspect it probably was written or compiled in some way in Tibet. Um, uh, and I'll be touching on that, the, my reasons later. But in any case, it's a kind of compilation text pulling from different other texts, um, the, the root sadhana. So there's what I just said. Uh, the second thing we can talk, uh, say about it is uh, it does proceed according to these two stages. So first you do the generation stage where you develop yourself into a Buddha and then you perform the sexual yoga in the perfection stage. And in the generation stage portion of the text, you see signs of Chan, Chinese Buddhist Chan influence. Um, and I, I, I've talked about that with Sam Bonskayak in this article where Chan and Tantra meet. And basically what this author does is take the initial opening moment where you dissolve everything into emptiness before you then regenerate as the Buddha. That dissolution into emptiness and meditation on emptiness is talked about in Chan terms. And in fact, there's another manuscript where he then takes some of this tantric language and applies it to a short meditation text attributed to Bodhidharma. So he's going both ways, reading Chan into Tantra and Tantra into Chan. But you see some of this Chan influence in the root text itself. And that's really one of the main reasons I don't think this is, a t is an Indian sadhana, the root text. So, just to conclude that obvious point now, that the root verses are some kind of composite sadhana, probably compiled in Tibet, maybe even in Dunhuang, and the commentary anyway was probably written in Dunhuang. So we're going to set aside the generation stage and just look at the perfection stage, the second half of the text where you find the sexual yoga, and it's there that you find no Chan influence anymore, uh, but you do see uh, parallel passages in other uh, Indic tantric ritual writings um, pr preserved in the Tengur, um, the Tibetan canon. Uh, and um, most significantly for the purposes of this talk, and again, this, we'll be coming back to this, is the parallel passages uh, between our uh, root sadhana and this Jnanotara Patalakrama, which is a, probably early to mid seventh century, much earlier text. Um, so that's interesting and very significant for our purposes, but we'll return to all this later. Okay, so the perfection stage according to this text proceeds according to four samadhis, four stages, four steps. I've never seen these anywhere else. But they basically outline something vaguely familiar which is initially you imagine yourself as the deity. So you've already generated yourself as the deity, but now you sort of imagine yourself as the deity. And then you do a, me a mental recitation, meaning you're not saying Om Mani Pei Mei Hong or whatever your mantra is. You're, you're just sort of mentally reciting it and it's spinning at your heart on a heart, on a moon disc. And then in the third stage, you perform the sexual yoga proper. And this is where you get this cycling of the breath between sexual partners, and that's where we're going to be focusing on, uh, where we're going to be focusing, which is why it's underlined on your, uh, on your uh, handout. And then there's the closing kind of rites in the fourth samadhi. So we're zeroing in on step three here of the perfection stage. So these are the very short lines that the root sadhana offers on this. It says, the unchanging syllables strung together as a garland resound constantly like the sound of a bell, performing the projecting and gathering of light in the manner of a spinning firebrand, gathering back one presses down with the word, the method for leading is applied with a mute hum. <laughs> completely obscure what's going on here. <laughs> Um, but basically what's happening here is after you do the initial mental recitation with the uh, mantra at your heart, you now 
are in sexual union and you uh, send the string of syllables down the center, this is from the male's perspective, uh, down through from your heart down to the, through the penis into the woman and the consort and up, up her spine, there's no central channel yet, it uses the word for spine, out her mouth and back into your mouth and cycling between the two of you and reciting the mantra. So that's the unchanging syllables strung together as a garland resound constantly like the sound of the bell and performing the pr projecting and gathering of light. That's the point that's very strange because what we're talking about is circular, not the normal uh, sparna, samharana, kind of uh, expanding and contracting of light that's so common in tantric ritual. But they're using that language of projecting and gathering to talk about a cycling practice, which is awkward, but there's a reason. And it's, it's like as if, as if it were a spinning firebrand, like if you've ever taken a sparkler or a, a burning a stick that has a burning tip and spun it at night, you can make a circle, right? That's the image. And then as you gather it all back down, you press it down with the word, with a, with a word, and um, that somehow is about sort of the pump that's moving it initially, getting the, the flow going. Uh, and something about a home. Well, so th there is commentary, thank God, and I want to look a little more at this line four and five. So gathering back, one presses down with the word. What is that all about? This commentary says, the secret substance, meaning the bodhicitta, which is a euphemism for the semen, basically. The secret substance is hum vajra drik. So it's a physical substance that is a mantra. Somehow. Uh, if it were just the home, which normally a drop of semen is, is often identified with this seed syllable home, but it says if it's just a home, it wouldn't be able to do anything. So they extract this heart syllable home, which is the heart syllable of all the Buddha families, and then they or further ornament it to make home vajra drik. And now it's got power and it can move, and you press that substance down with the korla, with the chakra, only mention of chakra in all of Dunhuang literature that I've ever seen, uh, you press it down with the chakra at the center of your navel, and then it arises in the vajrapath, meaning the penis, and it descends into the space of the consort, meaning the vagina of the consort, and then mounts her spine, and so on. So this is also kind of interesting, that they're talking about a chakra for the first time. Still no central channel, uh, but chakras, one, anyway. <laughs> and the fifth line, one projects forth the above mentioned hum, and then without expressing its sound, one inhales the hum back inside, think that it dissolves with fragrance into one's left nostril, and then continues on its cycle. So I guess the mute hum means, again, you're not saying this out loud. You're just listening to it resonate with its own sound as you breathe. Okay, so that's the introduction and th introducing our manuscript and the ritual we want to talk about. S part three, other evidence from Dunhuang on this, uh, on this practice. So like I say, I spent years reading all these sexual yogas from Dunhuang. As far as I could tell, there's no subtle body except these two manuscripts that are talking about this one sadhana, and I didn't know what to make of it. It seemed like such a sort of outlier. So then uh, I started reading more carefully into some of these other sadhanas, and I found tiny little inklings of similar kind of practices that seem vaguely related, nothing quite the same, but there's this one, which is probably also based on the Guya Samaja Tantra, and this one's probably a translation from an Indic original, called the Kelkye Shejawa Drupe Tap, the generation of fortune, Salbagya, um, sadhana. And uh, this is a very sort of stripped down basic sexual yoga with a uh, generation stage and completion, perfection stage. And, um, and we zoom in on the moment of sexual union that is relevant for us uh, with these lines. 
once more stabilize within that state of majesty. So you're in sexual union, and in this practice you are retaining the drop, which is to say not emitting the semen, not allowing for a complete orgasm. Uh, so you're stabilizing within that state. In accordance with the, you do that with, oh no, sorry. In accordance with the ritual procedures, the jewel sprout, the, um, which is the drop, uh, is positioned at the top of the head, which is code for the tip of the penis, uh, and it's held there. Om, and then Om Ah Hum Swaha. The five great consecrating heart syllables consecrate the five places in your body. No explanation of how or why or what that is. And then it says, by means of the yoga for protecting, meaning, again, not have, emitting the drop, to the best of one's ability, firmly protect the city identity, which again is the bodhicitta. By means of the four principles, we'll be coming back to that, the recitations should also be performed to the best of one's ability. So this is a recitation practice. While not having orgasm, and holding the drop, and there's something about five syllables on, at five points of your body. Other than that, we get no explanation in this manual for what is going on in these three lines here in the middle. But maybe it's something related to our cycling practice. I honestly am not sure. There's another manuscript, Paleo Tibetan 42, which is a very long uh, manual for the Gana, Gana Chakra, a, a tantric feast. And, um, and it's here that we find a practice uh, that, again, sounds kind of related, uh, at places on oneself as the Mahamudra. So Mahamudra has a history, long history after this as the be-all and end-all of tantric practice. At this time, it just means the body of the Buddha. You have the form of the Buddha. So at places on oneself, as the Mahamudra, meaning as a Buddha that you've already generated yourself as. Uh, arrange a yellow om, the colors are all messed up. A om at the top of the head, a red om at the mouth, hum at the heart, uh, swaha at the waist, and a ha on the soles of the feet. Uh, so there again you see om hum swaha, which we saw in the previous manuscript. Those emanate light rays which regather, so they're using this language whereby there comes a mustard seed sized form and there's this little interlinear note here that says through the gathering of the five colored light rays as they return there's a gnosis body a, 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 a jnana body um, there at your heart and then it moves through the interior of one's body meaning descends down emerging at the tip of the nose, which we'll get to, I'll return to, but in this context it means the penis, then emanates light rays at the tip, from the tip of the penis and regathers back and forth. Constantly, c cultivate constantly in that way, and then once it, everything becomes luminous, it's called habituation to the subtle vajra, meaning the subtle vajra, I think, is the drop held at the tip of the nose. And you, once as a sign of success, is when everything suddenly becomes luminous. So in this practice, there's not really a cycling, but there's a movement down to the tip of the vajra, and it's held there, and there's this expansion and contraction of light rays until success occurs. I would argue bas that basically our text, talking about the cycling, is using the language of projecting and contracting because it's coming out of this. So our text, in a way, is this is more a typical Guya Samaja practice. And our text is basically reading the cycling into this moment in normal Guya Samaja tantric practice and turning it in from just a simple expansion and contraction of light rays into a cycling. And so that, that, the awkward use of that language in our text is kind of a vestige of this system. Just to show that this is this, this Gana Chakra uh, passage is typical of the Guya Samaja. Here's uh, actually there's one of the few tantras at Dunhuang. There's there's an almost complete Guya Samaja, a copy of the Guya Samaja tantra with tons of interlinear notes that nobody has worked on yet. Basically, is an entire commentary. Um, 
And uh, in the sixth chapter, which is where they talk about the completion stage, the perfection stage practice of sexual yoga, it says, while resting in the Mahamudra, again, in the form of the Buddha in that way, clearly cultivate a white mustard seed at one's heart, which could be identified with the bodhicitta, the semen, and then move it from within, move it up to the uh, tip of one's nose, cultivate rising to one's nose and then remaining at the tip of the nose. Habituate, this is the commentary on note, by the way. Habituate to that, cultivate the entire container and its inhabitants to be contained within that mustard seed at the tip of the vajra, meaning there's an entire mandala in that drop of bodhicitta. But um, anyway, that's the kind of canonical passage for which our Ganachakra text is drawn, from which it's drawing for this practice. So this is kind of a somewhat known practice. There's no subtle body, but it's a movement of the drop of bodhicitta through the body and then held, and uh, it's called this subtle vajra practice, shukshma vajra. This is a, a, a commentary, uh, just a couple of verses later in the same chapter. In habituating to that, perform the retention, meaning don't emit the drop, of this method for extended union as long as you can while enacting the ga gathering and projection. Okay? All right, our, our last piece of evidence before moving on is, uh, sh is basically what I think is the source for this canonical Guya Samaja practice. So it's talking about the nose, the tip of the penis as an, a nose, and holding a drop at the tip of the nose, which is a little odd. In the Sarvatathagata Tapasangraha, which is a yoga tantra text with ostensibly no sexual yoga, you do find a very similar practice. And the Guya Samaja drew on this tantra, I think, pretty clearly. So um, there you see these four dhyanas um, in which uh, you place a subtle vajra at the tip of the actual nose and you expand it to fill the whole universe and then contract it back to the tip of the nose and you keep doing that until this subtle vajra, the, this drop, stabilizes, at which point visions come out, sort of like the luminosity sort of uh, emerges. So, there is an origin to that sexual practice in just a simple breathing, expansion, and contraction at the nose practice. So, our conclusions for this part three before moving on to the last part four of my talk. Um, the Guya Samaja Subtle Vajra practice seems to be a sexualized version of this earlier Yoga Tantra practice at the nose. And then, the, our Pelio Tibetan 634, uh, with its cycling practice, which takes place in the same context at the same moment of the sexual union, uh, and which shares elements such as this projecting and regathering of light rays, even though there isn't actually one, seems to be kind of a further elaboration on this practice. So you first get it in the STTS as a non sexual rite, it's sexualized in the Guya Samaja, and then our text is reading still further elements into it with a cycling of the breath between partners. All right? So that kind of explains a bit of where this practice is coming from, and it seems to be coming from this expansion and contraction of the breath and, and light rays through the universe. But the question is, why? so our, our manuscript is adding this new element of cycling between partners. Where is it getting this from? Right? And there's actually, I think, a potential uh, answer for this. And here again, I have three pieces of evidence to offer. So first, we go back to this manuscript. We've already seen this uh, generation of fortune sadhana and the exact same passage we already saw with this Oma Hum Swaha, the five great consecrating heart syllables, consecrating the five places in your body. What's going on there? That, uh, and, oh, and what I want to focus on in particular is this line, uh, by means of the four principles, Tini, Shi, um, which is some sort of method by which these recitations are performed while 
doing this expansion and contraction, something about different points in the body. And uh, anyway, this, this technical term of the four principles is interesting, and what is it? Actually, elsewhere in this manuscript, there's a sudden break in the text and uh, some notes inserted, which just interrupt the flow. Uh, and um, they outline a kind of typical sadhana. And in here, you see, Te Gona Ni Shi Tsugi Choberja. So you should perform the worship by means of the four, not Te Ni Shi, but Te Gona Ni Shi, four principles, basically. Um, and I would argue this is a reference to the same set, but you just get a slightly different wording for this, this set of four. And that's helpful because that enables us to make a link to this Jnana Um, which uh, I said before um, we would be returning to and belongs to an even earlier class of Ubaya Tantras, which our Buddha Gupta said is these texts that partake of Kriya and Yoga, and external and internal. So now we're back into the early to mid 7th century way before any sexual yoga. And this is, so this is a text that's actually still very important in Japanese Shingon today, as is the Sarvatathagata Tattvasangraha, which is the one with the practice at the nose. So these four principles appear in this Jnanotara Patalakrama. And, uh, and, he, and he, where, where they're basically, diff, uh, uh, a sort of way of breaking down a recitation practice where you have the principle, the, tenia, the, the principle of oneself, of the deity in front of you, and of the act of recitation, of reciting the mantra, and of the meditation, what you're imagining while doing that. Um, so in the text, for example, you find this verse, unchanging and endowed with the letters, changing from ground to ground in that way, one's own mantra, whichever is imagined, whatever your mantra is, should be thought to purify the mind. So there's some sort of practice between you and the deity in front of you where you're reciting a mantra. And Buddha Gupta, our, the same guy with the, the classes of tantras, has a commentary on this. And what he explains, this is 100 years after the Dhyanotra, uh, Patalakrama, uh, but he's <coughs> commenting on it. In order to distinguish further the details of that, it says, changing from ground to ground. The ground from which it moves is the ground of the completely perfected Buddha yourself as a Buddha, the ground to which it moves, oh, it, the, sorry, the Buddha is in front of you, the ground to which it moves is the ground of oneself, the body of one's own Buddha. One views the mind which takes on the aspect of the moon disk at the heart of one's own form, which has become one's own deity, endowed with the syllables of the secret mantra, and one recites until the end of the exhalation. And next, uh, one views in the same way again the ground of the completely perfected Buddha. It's, it's hard to understand. But, uh, and from that, the mind regathers uh, once more so that it comes to rest again in the ground, which is the body of one's own deity during which one performs the recitation. So what's happening here is you're imagining a Buddha in front of you, and as you breathe and recite the mantra, it's moving out of your mouth and into the mouth of the Buddha in front of you, into his heart, and then back into you, back and forth, back and forth. This is a practice still done in Japan today. So maybe our text, this 10th century Dunhuang text, is getting this cycling practice. For, this is one possible, it, both texts use this tiny, these four principles, this language of four principles, in talking about a, something of a cycling recitation practice. Of course, in the earlier text, there's no sexual element. A connection between these two texts is further strengthened by the fact that there are two lines, two verses that are shared between the Jyanotra Patalakrama and our text, these two. We read them before. The unchanging syllables strung as a garland resound constantly like the sound of the bell. Basically the same lines appear in the Jyanotra. So, that's interesting. So we have three connections between our third samadhi. I told you this is going to get technical. Um, and the Dhyanotra. We have a parallel passage. They're also connected through this other ITJ 464, which mentions how you have to use the four principles at this exact moment in the ritual. 
and both describe a recitation practice involving cycling a breath on a garland of syllables between yourself and another figure in front of you, one not sexualized and one sexualized. Now the third piece of evidence in this last section comes from the Mahavirochana Abhisambodhi Tantra, which you have as, the Abhi, uh, as the, uh, an example of Ubaya Tantra. And actually, this Jnanotra Patalakrama comes from the same circle of texts uh, uh, as the Mahavirochana. It's very closely related, um, and they're both Ubaya Tantra, and they're both talking about that the core practice is the same. So this Mahavirochana Abhisambodhi, I mentioned the Jnanotra is important in Japan. This, this, it's only because of this. The Mahavirochana Abhisambodhi is one of the two main tantras along with the Sarva Tathagata that form you know, the basis of Shingon uh, Buddhism in Japan. And you know, just to say it, the Japanese scholars of Shingon are always looking for evidence that uh, the, the, the Sarva Tathagata Tapasangraha and the uh, Mahavirochana Abhisambodhi were woven together before they got to Japan that the Japanese didn't just make this up and they're saying Amogavadra did it in China and this goes all the way back to India, but there's no evidence. Here's actually a practice that does seem to be weaving the two of them together in ways not, that's not what the Shingon scholars are talking about at all, but <laughs> actually, strangely enough, that's what you do see here. It's a sort of, they take the cycling from the Mahavirochana and uh, the, the expanding and contracting from the STTS and weave it together into a sexual rate. Anyway, to show you the evidence. Uh, so our Dionotara, the meditation supplement, is closely associated with this, and you can really see it in chapters five and six of the Mahavirochana. So here's the key recitation practice from this famous tantra. Letter should be joined to letter, likewise ground becomes ground, similar language as the Dionotara. You should recite 100,000 times mentally with restraint, the first letter is bodhicitta, the second is said to be sound. One ground is your tutelary deity, which is created in your body. The second ground should be known as the perfect Buddha, the most excellent of men. The mantra should imagine him uh, located in a pure moon disk. He should arrange, uh, carefully arrange the letters within that in sequence, suppressed by the drawn in syllables, life and exertion will be purified. That's pranayama, life and uh, exertion. I'll get back to that. Life is said to be breath. Exertion is recollection. After he has restrained both of them, he should do the preliminary service, which is the recitations. So this is difficult to understand, but it's basically, you can see enough that it's talking about the same practice as the Jnanotara, and you have these two figures of oneself and the Buddha in front of you. But then, Later in chapter six in the same tantra, you see a kind of more internalized version of this recitation practice. Then starting with any one of these essences, these syllables, you should accomplish the ground until it becomes definite. Then placing that essence, that syllable in your heart, you should accomplish your mind. Again, this is hard to understand, but let's just go generally. Uh, until it appears to be very pure, unsullied, stable, without wavering, free from conceptualization like a mirror, and very subtle. You should do it with continual application to the practice until you see your body as the body of the deity, so you become the deity. The second ground, that's ground one, the second ground is the perfect Buddha who sits on uh, the great lotus, royal lotus, with that same mirror disc at his heart, abiding in his own samadhi as though within a cave, sort of in this samadhi state. He has a top knot, a crown, and is surrounded by infinite light rays. He's devoid of all thoughts and concepts, peaceful from the very beginning like space. Imagining that the sound abides in him, you should recite in equipoise, and this, uh, that, is, that is the preliminary service should be done a uh, hundred thousand times. Uh, this actually doesn't show what I thought it would. Um, what happened? Uh, the idea here is that there's a, you can do it with, a, moon, uh, with a, a deity at your heart. So you can do it with the Buddha in front of you or a Buddha at your heart. Um, okay. Uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, 
to be placed, uh, very pure, unsullied, stable. Um, I think the idea is that the second ground is the perfect Buddha who sits upon a great, within that same mirror disk. Sorry, I should have emphasized that part of it. You've created the moon disk at your heart, and within that same, same one, so it's not that he has a heart, moon disk at his own heart, within your, the same moon disk at your heart, now there's another Buddha in your heart. And then you do the recitation practice between yourself and him. So no longer is the Buddha in front of you, but the Buddha is at your heart. And somehow you're cycling between, I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, but it's a kind of internalized version of this recitation practice. And, uh, and it may be for this reason that Buddha Gupta opens his commentary by observing that although this Vairochanabhisambodhi is a yoga tantra insofar as it is mainly for means and wisdom, uh, it, in order to appeal to those disciples who are oriented toward outward activities, meaning kriya, tantra, tantras, people who like that kind of thing, having an image in front of you to worship, it also teaches some practices that accord with kriya tantras, an outwardly focused practice. Therefore, it be, may be labeled and proclaimed as a kriya tantra, or you could call it an ubaya tantra, both kriya and yoga. So this is what I was talking about earlier in my talk. So basically what I'm saying, what, what he s seems to be saying is the reason he creates this category of ubaya is because where the Dhyanotara performs this recitation practice with, an, with a, a Buddha in front of you, the Mahavirochana offers two versions. You can either do that or you can do it kind of just within your own heart or the, within the, and the heart of the Buddha at your heart. So you can do it outwardly or inwardly. It's both. So, all right, the conclusions of our last part here. Paleo-Tibetan's perfection stage cycling practice may have come directly or indirectly from this circle of texts that included the Dhyanotra, it's borrowings of the same verses and so on. Uh, and whereas that practice, the Dhyanotra is completely outwardly focused the Mahavirochanabhisambodhi offers an internalized version of the cycling practice with a Buddha at one's heart. So it sort of updates the Jyanotra slightly to a more Yoga Tantra style of practice. And then, in a sense, our PT 634 then sexualizes it. So, insofar as Kriya is outwardly focused rituals, Yoga is inwardly focused rituals, and Maha Yoga is sexual practices. This, in a way, these are three different takes on the exact same recitation practice, one outward, one inward, one sexualized. So that's quite nice, actually. So I'm arguing in answer to the question, where's this cycling coming from? It's coming straight out of this world of Dhyanotra and Mahavirochnabhi Sambodhi. So, just to review, our Paleo Tibetan 634 appears to combine this subtle Vajra practice, i.e. the practice of expanding and regathering at the tip of the nose. Um, it, it's, it's combining, it's, it's drawing on this STTS, this Yoga Tantra, which has it at the tip of the actual nose. And then it combining that, which, which through the Guya Samaja Tantra, which is sexualizes that practice, and is combining that with the cycling practice seen in Dhyan, the Dhyanotara, and the Mahavirochnabhi Sambodhi um, and putting them together into this cycling breath recitation, mantra recitation while in sexual union. Now why is this all interesting? <laughs> What's interesting is that still later, keeping in mind our ritual, our PT634 probably is, look, is, is reflecting late 8th century Indian ritual. A little later in India, in the 9th and 10th centuries, you start getting these writings of what's called the Arya school of Guya Samaja interpretation. And in that school, they're very interested in a practice called Vajra Japa or Vajra recitation. And this is practiced today in Tibet. So this is a very well-known practice that's central to the perfection stage. And it's uh, seen in this Panchakrama, this all-important text of the Arya school which the Geluk school in particular is very interested in, but all sorts of other texts of this Arya school. Um, but in this Arya school uh, practice, the Vajra Japa is 
performed while in sexual union, but um, is just a breathing back and forth from mouth to mouth, not a full circle. A little more like the Jyanotara Patalakrama was. Um, but still, it's done while in sexual union between sexual partners. So what I want to suggest is that <coughs> this practice of cycling between sexual partners while retaining the drop went on to be preserved in the Arya school in a slightly different form. And actually you see other versions of it in Hevadra writings from later in Tibet. Uh, but that RPT 634 represents a kind of developmental stepping stone between the early recitation, mantra recitation rites in the pre, you know, in the Mahavirojana, SDTS, and the Guya Samaja, and what later came to be known as the Arya school. And it's because you get this, these ritual writings that are sort of between the tantras, between the canonical texts, that we get a little glimpse into how this is all how, you know, how it's all in the making um, and it hasn't fully uh, concealed its origins yet. So all of this, I would argue, sheds light on the emergence of a perfection stage pranayama practice, which is uh, the practice of restricting, controlling the breath, which is exactly what ends up uh, so famous in yoga, yoga practice today. Um, and it's even called pranayama all the way back in the, um, in the Jnanotra Patalakrama and in our manuscript. Uh, so it's a very early sexual pranayama practice uh, performed while in sexual union, a practice that was more about cycling between partners, uh, whereas the later uh, models, once you start getting the channels, the three channels and everything, becomes what I would argue more appropriative versions of sexual yoga, where the whole point from the male perspective is to draw the female's energies up his central channel and sort of take them for himself. And this is the kind of practice that's typical in the Kala Chakra and so on later and is practiced today. But not to idealize the past, but maybe this was more of a, a sherry time. <laughs> that's still completely written from the male perspective. Okay, that's it. Thanks.